Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. Today we will talk about an extra topic. Yeah, so it's like a Christmas lecture with some special topic called causality. Um, I also have included the topic of causality in previous lectures, so it's not like completely new or something. But it's something that maybe not everyone has on the radar right now. But I think it's a very important topic and it will gain importance in the future. However, before we start with causality, there were a couple of things in the previous slides that I didn't talk about at the very end. So I will keep that short, but I want to show it to you. So let's see, I should jump right to the right slide. I can't, so whatever, then I need to go through it like this. So here we go. So this is about now tricks of the trade. So it is about deep learning and there are some tricks to make it work and I cannot cover all of the tricks. So there's a lot of detail and a lot of Handwerk as we would say in German. So a lot of babysitting of processes that do some learning like babies also need some babysitting. Also your neural network needs some babysitting. But there are some things at least that, that I want to point out that they are more like starting points. They are not the final answers here. So some general tricks. Um, so those are now copied from some paper which I wrote with, with my PhD student or PhD student I wrote it and I'm, I'm one of the courses so I also wrote some of it where we wrote in 2012 a paper on using neural networks for image denoising and it was quite surprising how great the performance was. At the beginning of the project so I wanted to do something whatever with kernel machines or something fancy at that time but um, my PhD student Christopher Berger he said no I really want to do neural networks and that was in 2012 where no one was talking about neural networks so actually the research started maybe in 2010 2011 and he said no I want to do image denoising with neural networks and I say okay you can give it a try Publishing at NeurIPS is not very easy if you have neural networks in your title. However, if you really insist, then try to do it. And he insisted and he had very great intuition. And he was able then to beat the state of the art at that point in denoising, in image denoising with using neural networks. And that was really surprising to many people. However, to really make these things run, these deep learning methods or these neural networks, there are some tricks. And so... <clears throat> There are a couple of goals. For example, we want to avoid flat regions in the loss function. So what do I mean by that one? So your loss landscape yeah, might, might look like this, like something blah, like this. And this is a loss function, basically. And you are moving around along that one. And actually, you are after such a local or such a global optimal. But sometimes you also can get stuck in local optima, right? As it turns out, in high dimension, that's not such a super big issue anymore. A bigger issue, because in higher dimension, what well, we are having here is 3D world, and maybe there's a path around it and a path around it to get to that one. And as it turns out, when you have very large models in deep learning, surprisingly, they converge to very good solutions at the end. Maybe not to the global optimum, but to very good solutions. If you, have the right, uh, if you use the right tricks. Um, a bigger issue often in deep learning is that there might be very flat regions. So if you're, if you're right here, then your gradient might be yeah, very, very small and you will have very little progress until you really jump into the basin here. Okay? So in deep learning, what you want to avoid is, for example, flat regions. And how can you avoid flat regions? Um, let's take these activation function, this one, which is the um, tangent superbolicus, okay, and this works very nice and generates a nice region, a uh, gradient in this area, right, where you have something, some, some non-zero derivative. However, if you have data, which is like very far off, very, very negative or very positive, yeah, for example, in the input layer, yeah, then you are in a very flat region of your tangent superbolicus, and then somehow the gradient signal is very, very weak. Okay, there is a gradient signal, but it might be very weak. For that reason, typically we try to normalize the data so that our data is in the interesting area of the tangent superbolicus. Okay, so that's like some intuition. So very important 
is to transform your input points that they have mean zero and variance one. And the idea is to avoid flat region of the loss function. The other thing is also the initialization of the weights is very critical. Yeah? So there are also some very good heuristics how to do that. So how do you start with the W? So what, what should be the scale of the, the parameters that you start with? And there are some very good um, tricks which can be experimentally shown to be very good, but there are also, also some theory behind it. And here the, the trick, for example, is to sample from a normal distribution with mean zero. So you get positive and negative numbers. And the standard deviation should, should be somehow have something to do with the number of nodes that you have. Okay, so the number of input nodes in this case of a linear brick. And that's now some heuristic, which turns out to be a very good choice. The other thing is the learning rate should not be everywhere the same. But in, a, in each layer, the learning rate should be kind of be proportional to the number of input nodes again. So if you have a, a very wide layer, maybe your learning rate in, in total um, should be smaller than in an area where you have a smaller layer, for example. And those are lots of tricks that you should um, kind of use. If you, if you don't have these tricks, then the whole thing might not work. Um, actually, our paper, of course, is not the original source of these kind of tricks. We just used them and explained some of them. There's also an archive paper on these tricks. But the main source actually is a book from 1998 from Leon Boutou and Jan Lecker and Klaus Robert Müller and Ohr. I forgot the first name of Ohr. And this book is called Efficient Backprop. Oh, this is a, I think it's a, the book is called Tricks of the Trade. And the paper in there is called Efficient Backprop. So if you Google for this one, that is a seminal paper which shows many of the tricks which are still valid today. Okay, so if you want to do deep learning, check out the Efficient Backprop paper. Um, then there's other tricks. So for example, some sometimes very large networks that might overfit your data, which means that it's perfect on the training data, but it will be very bad on test data. And then there's the so-called dropout trick. And the dropout trick is to reduce the overfitting. And maybe, so this is the description um, of it, but maybe easier I show you our, our visual description of the dropout block. So basically it's a, it's a block without any parameters, which is not completely true, but there's no parameter that you want to tune during the learning. So there is a parameter called P and this parameter P does the following. So instead of passing on all information in the X, you zero out some of the entries. So you're basically damaging the input for the subsequent uh, layers, okay? So you do this by generating a binary matrix or a binary vector, yeah? Where with probability P, yeah, you, you keep um, a value and with probability one minus P, you zero it out, okay? So you really randomly sample such a binary vector, which is then masking your input and passing on something else. And then on the, for the back propagation, you, you are required to remember from the forward pass what you zeroed out because only to those that have been not zeroed out, you need to pass on the gradient then from the y to the x. Okay, so, and this looks like a bad idea, right? It's, it looks like uh, you, you are really making the work harder for the neural network, but actually you're making the whole neural network more robust. So if it's able to learn something, even with dropout layers in between, then you really learn some very good features that are helping each other. But there's much more to say about it. I just want to drop it here. Um, then there are different optimization strategies. So there's this typical stochastic gradient descent, but there are others like, for example, there's a stochastic gradient descent with momentum, okay? And this momentum term, this is like in physics, instead of having um, uh, like a, uh, let's say you have some, some something Starting here, some sphere and it's rolling down with a normal stochastic gradient descent, it can happen that it just stops here, right? However, in, 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 if it would be a physical system, then this thing would overshoot a little bit. So this thing will have a high, large velocity down here, and so it will overshoot. And possibly it even jumps over the sill if it comes down with enough speed. So you want to add this kind of physical intuition to your optimization process, okay? And those are all ideas from mathematical optimization. And so here you are not directly updating the weights, but basically you're updating a velocity, okay? And so this velocity is now a linear combination of the new direction, yeah, and the old direction that you did last step. And then you could, for example, say, okay, with 0 0.9, I want to forget 
the last step and with 0.1 or with 0.5 or something with some weights, you now want to believe the new direction. And then your update is just updating using these velocities. This is like a differential equation discretized. And then there are some other things, Nesterov acceleration gradient NAG method. So that is very similar like the momentum method with a little change of having some plus mu VT here. And this one has some very nice mathematical properties that can be solved and they've been solved in 1983. So now you can use all the knowledge from mathematical optimization from some weird papers where people claim that there are some great optimization trick with some little things. You can try them in deep learning and then you can look via cross-validation whether they really make sense or not in your problem, okay? And then there's ADAGRED, which is basically averaging like the last, um, uh, all gradients are kind of normalized by some average gradient, for example. So this is like also some, some normalization trick somehow, which sometimes works well, sometimes it doesn't work. And there's typically also some, some theory behind it, okay? So far, so good. So those, this should just point out that there are lots of tricks of the trade and there's a lot of handwerk, so a lot of special knowledge to get these things to work. Okay, so it's like um, when you learn to program, you also, you first learn if then else for and so on, but then you need some practice to really become a good programmer. Yeah, it's the same as if you want to play piano and you read a book on playing piano, yeah, so that might bring you somewhere, right? Then you might know what the keys are called, but you will never be able to play a fugue or something, yeah, a fugue, a Bach fugue or something. So that, that's not possible. That's something motoric that you need to learn. And with programming, it's the same. So if you don't program, um, you might know everything about programming language, but you can't really program if you don't practice it. The same is with deep learning. If you don't practice it, if you don't make neural networks and you play around with them and fiddle with a parameter and get a good intuition, then it, you won't get very far. And these tricks of the trades are like um, the, the gossip knowledge that, that you additionally know. And I, ideally, there's a lecture on that one, and there will be one, I think, in the next semester, there should be the lecture Deep Learning. Hopefully, I, I will give it. And um, there we learn some of these tricks as well, and there's lots of practice and a lot of um, tutorials and a lot of Jupyter notebooks to, to play around with deep learning. So it should be interesting for many of you. Um, so far we looked at the supervised case of neural network. Why supervised is the natural one? Because we always need a loss function, right? So we, we have a computational graph. So we have some, some neural network, whatever, and X goes into a big box. And at the end, we need some loss function that we can minimize. And then we can update all the parameters in here. So we really need um, a loss function. So typically we need a supervisor for that one, right? So we need some some guiding signal which is telling us whether how, in which direction the weight should be should be moved so how can we do unsupervised learning then um, and i want to give you an example of an unsupervised neural network in the following the so-called auto associative neural network also called auto encoder which is a network that just takes data x and the y is not given right so now how can we have a learning signal so the learning signal works like this so the input are the axes then we do some processing and the output are the axes as well. And then our learning signal is just the difference between the input and the output. Now you might wonder, so what's the whole point of this? So why do that? Why, is, why not just learn use the identity function? The trick here is, in between possibly, we, we limited the dimensionality. So the input dimensionality might be three, but in between there's a layer with only a single neuron. So we are trying to map the data onto a one-dimensional space such that we still are able to reconstruct the data. Yeah? So this is like a nonlinear PCA thing. Okay, so there's a connection loss now. So is, are, are you still with me? Could you wave your hand to the people with camera? Okay, so that still works. So the connection problem might be elsewhere in this case. But um, okay, there, there's a video at the end. So if this might be a bad, bad quality, so you can hear that part again. So the key is here, you learn the identity function, but in a difficult way. So you have a layer where there's only one, one um, node here. So which means you're basically doing something like a nonlinear PCA type of thing here. And so this picture is from a diploma by it called Nichtlinear Hauptkomponentenanalyse auf Basis Neuronaler Netze from 2002 from Matthias Scholz. 
He also has a website on that one. And in the following, I'm telling a little bit about this project from um, from Matthias Scholz. So he's looking at these this problem. So you have some nonlinearly embedded manifold. In this case, even possibly in 2D embedded, but it's somewhat lying on a curved two-dimensional coordinate system. So it would be nice to recover the two-dimensional coordinate system here. And now the neural network, how does it look? It, it really just looks like we've written it up before. So we have some linear transformations and tangent superbolicus and a couple of layers basically, okay? And then the loss function we are minimizing is basically the difference of the input minus the output, and that's it. So this is our loss signal, and this is a scalar again, okay? And um, what's... Ah, now of course the question is fine. If we have a, a single node in between, that's great, right? So we can recover a 1D um, signal. However, what about if we want to have like a 2D coordinate system, we want to reconstruct that? How could we do that one? And for that, the um, the setup could be that we have a neural network where there's a bottleneck layer in between where we have like two dimensions instead of having one. Okay, so maybe we have 100 dimensional data and then the bottleneck layer, this one with the very few neurons is not having one, but maybe two neurons. And by that we get a two dimensional embedding. And this kind of approach um, he calls like symmetric nonlinear PCA. And since he's called He's calling it symmetric. There's also a non-symmetric version of it, which is more interesting. And that is the so-called hierarchical one because the symmetric one has the following problem. So it's only about the reconstruction error. So in this case, for example, this is a perfect embedding already if we just use the identity function, right? So let's say the input dimensionality is two-dimensional, but there's a more interesting lower dimensional um, representation so maybe we can also kind of first find a 1D embedding and give it more weight and then we kind of reconstruct the rest. And that is the idea of this hierarchical nonlinear PCA where he basically has a combination of two loss functions where we have one neural network which is kind of finding one dimension and this is fixing all the weights for the first bottleneck node and then there's some other nodes, basically a second node that then is influencing a second loss function over here. So by clever construction, um, he's then able to recover complicated nonlinear structures like in higher dimensions, okay? I won't go into much more detail. I just wanted to mention this, that there's some interesting work beyond supervised machine learning with deep neural networks. So you can also have some unsupervised approaches. So far so good for this one. So that should be just a very a quick introduction to um, unsupervised neural networks. Okay, if there's no question of that one, then let's start now with the topic of causality, which is now totally different topic and it's a little bit beyond the typical machine learning thing. So the causality lecture today is a, like an introduction to the bigger causality lecture that I'm offering in the master and this should just give you some intuition. So it's basically an introduction to the problem and why it might be interesting. So here's an interesting plot. So this is plotting the chocolate consumption against the number of Nobel laureates. And you might have seen that. That is from some New England Journal of Medicine. So this is a real paper, right? And this is a real author, this Messerly. And of course, um, Messerly is aware that um, this is a weird comparison, right? But the striking thing here is that they are very correlated, these two axes. Basically, the chocolate consumption is very much correlated to the number of Nobel laureates that we have. And if you do some classical statistics on that one, you get a very, very small p-value, which is also saying this is a very significant result that the correlation is so strong. Okay, so we have a correlation of 0 0.8, where the largest correlation would be 1.0. Okay, so they are really very strongly correlated. So up here is Switzerland with having, I don't know, 33 Nobel laureates per 10 million population and they're eating quite a bit of chocolate, okay? Now from a diagram like that, then Germany could say, okay, we want to increase the number of Nobel laureates, so let's eat more chocolate. So we need to subvention chocolate or make it cheaper or get rid of the Mehrwertsteuer for chocolate or whatever, right? So of course, in this example, you see, okay, this is of course garbage, right? So maybe we are measuring something else here. So it's probably more about the 
um, uh, more industrial, more richer countries who have more money to buy chocolate, and they also have more money to put into research. Okay, so there's some other variable actually that is influencing both of these things. So if we would draw a, a graphical model for that one, yeah, um, in causality we um, basically have graphical models, then we would have the, the chocolate consumption here, which is chocolate node and Oh, we write it without the S, maybe like with the C. And then we have the, the Nobel laureates, Nobel Prize. And instead of saying, okay, eating chocolate influences the Nobel Prizes directly, maybe the right way to think about it is something like this, uh, the industrialization of a country or something, and that is influencing the amount of chocolate, and it's also influencing the number of Nobel Prizes, okay? However, this is a variable that is not in the plot. That's why these two look so correlated. And of course, there are many other, many other cases like that. So here's another one. So this is the global average temperature versus the number of pirates, okay? This is also quite interesting. And we see that, so we see temperature increasing, yeah, since the industrialization, the number of pirates really went down, right? So this is so we see that the, the global global warming looks like it's something good right so the number of pirates is going down perfect right and again you could draw a similar diagram as i just did on the board for this case right so maybe there's something else there's some other node here yeah and causality the whole topic is about thinking about causal models so about modeling data like that and finding a mathematical framework to have some valid statements about the data and to avoid the wrong ones, okay? So here are a couple of more examples that are kind of fun. So the more firemen are sent to a fire, the more damage is done, okay? I got that from some blog post on Stack Exchange. So it looks like if I send fewer firemen to a fire, then maybe there's less damage, right? And of course, also in this example, we know, yes, of course, if there's a large fire, then there's more damage. and we also would send more firemen. So there's some other variable here. Here's another one. Children who get tutored gets worse grades than children who get not tutored, okay? That's also a fun one, right? Of course, there's again a selection bias somewhere here. So that there, of course, the children who are not so talented, who, who are more struggling in school, they get tutored and they will have worse grades with or without the tutoring, right? Maybe slightly better, hopefully. Here's another one. In early elementary school years, astrological sign correlated with IQ, okay? But this correlation weakens with age and disappears by adulthood. That's a weird one, that's funny. However, the reason on this one is that in, in your first uh, year in primary school, yeah, maybe you are six years old or something, and then something like four or five months, which will change your astrological sign will make a big difference okay so children who having an age difference of a couple of months and at that age might really have different skills and so for that reason it will disappear by adulthood because then kind of it averages out and people adjust here's another one when people play golf they are more likely to be rich yeah so let's all start playing golf or maybe if we don't want to be rich we avoid playing golf okay and of course here again there's something behind the scenes going on. These are all examples which are kind of obvious to us and they are sometimes entertaining and fun. Um, however, in um, economy or in politics, right, there might be things, so is uh, whatever, is the, the, the nine euro ticket like increasing the number of people moving from cars to take public transportation or not? So we can measure some data and then we want to draw conclusions about policy. So what action is really giving us like the right outcome, okay? Or how to decrease the unemployment rate or whatever. What does higher taxation of rich people, what does it give us? Is it good or bad? Or will people go elsewhere and something like this? Or So these, these questions are, in, in real life, they are very unobvious, the answers. And then if you have the right data, if you have the right statistics or the right plot, yeah, maybe you get very wrong decisions at the end. So it's very important to study this um, precisely and to find out about these kind of effects, to learn it, to, to recognize it, if, if the data set really tells us something about an action to do or not. 
There are a couple of books I would like to recommend for you, maybe on your during your Christmas time if you are bored. So uh, have a look at the following books. So the, the one that I um, would encourage you to look at would be um, Elements of Causal Inference from former colleagues of mine. So they are former colleagues of mine, so I'm here biased, of course. But um, the good thing is the PDF can be downloaded for free. So you can just download it and read the book or online or on your iPad or whatever. So and it's it can be legally downloaded, yeah. And then if you like it, go ahead and buy it. Um, there's another one, and this is from Julia Pearl, who's one of the giants in causality, or maybe the person who, who kind of um, made the field like a real science. And he also got the Turing Award for this kind of research. And here's a couple of books, but the one that I would recommend to beginners would be Causal Inference and Statistics, and that is a book meant for practitioners, where with pr practitioners now I mean sociologists or epidemiologists or econometric people, yeah, people who are having the data and who want to apply statistical methods. And um, this book is like really nicely written with a lot of examples. And I think that one is super useful in understanding the details. The good thing is also for that one, there are previews available on this URL. So basically, I think all the pages of this book are somewhere behind this URL and you can read it on this website completely. I think it's also not super expensive, but um, if you just want to get into the topic, it might be first okay to read some online resources on that one. Um, the classic on this one is from Julia Pearl called Causality. Maybe there's even a third edition out now. I'm not sure. So I still have the first edition. So this is like the standard book. However, I think it's um, it's a collection of some very important publications from Julia Pearl that has been expanded and um, contain a lot of discussion and connections to econometrics and to other related fields. So this is like a like a very um, yeah maybe the, the the standard textbook on causality. Um, however, it's slightly older than this one. So these elements of causal inference might be a little bit more modern. And in particular, I'm interested more in this book because it's coming from a machine learning lab. So they also have these additional machine learning perspective on things, which I like a lot. Um, then there's a classical one called Causation Prediction and Search from Peter Spertis, Clark Bleimer and Richard Chines. Those are all researchers, I think, at Carnegie Mellon University who also did quite a bit of research in causality. I think they are from a philosophy department or something, which in the US doesn't mean that it's not mathematical. So also at the philosophy departments in the US are like some really mathematical logicists. And also this is very mathematical and very rigorous. So it's a very nice book also for people who like formulas. If you can't decide on what book you should look at, there's a nice flow chart, which I found on the on the blog from Brady Neal. So basically that's, that's where the books all appear. So this is the one from Pearl. This is the one from Peters and also some other books appear here from the economics literature. And basically, by going through the graph, you can find your book that, that, that fits you, okay? It's a bit fun, but it has some, some deeper meaning. So in some of them, for example, um, so one question is, do you like graphs, okay? And graphs are the one that, that's coming from Julia Pearl's books. So he's basically proposing to use these graphical models, and then you can think clearly about it. And I'm totally with him. So I think graphical models are the way to go. However, there are other things. For example, here, if you hate them, these graphs, then you should read like Rubin's book or Rosenbaum. And they have more, I think, a statistical approach and they don't draw graphs. OK, and it's kind of interesting. Um, how can you do causal reasoning without drawing graphs? That's kind of funny for me, at least. So I think the graphs are essential. Nonetheless, those are also very famous super experts. So I, maybe I should read the books before having really a judgment here that whether you have to do use graphs or not. Anyway, so that might be a flow chart. Let's um, now start with some of the things that are relevant for causality. Let's start with correlations. And we've seen already quite a few examples. Here's another one, another fun example, which I got from some talks from Bernhard Schulkopf. So which is the number of stalks and the number of births in Baden-Württemberg, okay? And there you see that the number of stalks went down from 1966 to 1975, and the number of births 
in Baden-Württemberg also went down. Oh, so they are very, very strongly correlated, right? Suggesting that possibly um, storks bring the babies. So that's one option. Yeah, so that would mean the storks are the cause and the babies are the effect or the other way around, babies like storks. So if the number of, of babies decreases, then there are also fewer storks. No, the other way around, storks like babies. So if there are no babies anymore, the storks will go elsewhere where there are more babies or there might be some common cause, which is kind of implying both like industrialization or whatever wealth of a, uh, or maybe um, environmental issues or these kind of things that all go together and they might lead to fewer babies and to fewer storks. Um, however, the correlation is very large. So let's look at this number, this correlation number. So there's a so-called correlation coefficient now, and that's basically a normalized covariance. So this curve here is called the covariance. And let me see, I have a formula for that one, um, but let me write it down on the board slightly differently. So suppose, um, we have two variables, two random variables, x and y. Then typically we look at the, the mean, for example, which is the expectation of x. So that might be the mean of x, and there's the mean of y, which is the expectation of y. And we also look at the variance. And the variance basically is um, the expectation of x minus the mean squared, right? So that would be the variance of x and the variance of y is the same thing for the y. Okay, so I think this is without any typos. Fine, so this, those are basically some interesting numbers that describe the distribution of x. Those are two numbers which describe the distribution of y, right? However, it doesn't tell us how these things are kind of um, influencing each other. And for that one, we have the correlation, okay? And the correlation is based on the covariance. And so let's write down an expression for the covariance. So the covariance, um, do I have some letter for that one? I have no idea what the right letter for covariance is. Let's take a C, and it's the expectation of x minus the mean times y minus the mean. So you see, it's a mixture of those two. So you take one factor from the top one and one factor from the bottom one and you multiply it, okay? By the way, um, those are, this is the same entry as you would have on the covariance matrix, right? So the covariance matrix, if you view, would view this now as a multivariate random variable, then the covariance matrix will have the following entry. So we will have the sigma squared x up here and the sigma squared y down here. And here we will have these covariance terms. Okay, so it's just an off diagonal term of your covariance matrix. Okay, so that is the covariance. Now, what one can um, do if you want to have, if you say the scaling kind of doesn't matter, so I don't care whether I'm looking at 100 times x or 0.1 times x, and the scaling of y also should matter. For that, we have the correlation coefficient, which is like a normalized covariance. So typically we write rho, and rho then is just the c divided by sigma x times sigma y. Okay, if we look at the units, so the correlation, uh, the covariance is like um, meters squared, so it's the unit of x times the unit of y, let's say x and y are meters, so it's meters squared. The variance and the variance of x and y are also meters squared. And so we need to divide by the standard deviation of x and y. And so this thing is a dimensionless unit. So it's, a, it's a, something that is from the interval minus one to one, okay? And we also know maybe that if we have a zero on the off diagonal, we would say, um, the two random variables are uncorrelated. Yeah? For Gaussian distributions, that would mean they have nothing to do with each other. They don't know anything about each other. In this case, if we would normalize a zero, right, we would have zero divided by something which is non-zero, then the correlation will be also zero. So basically, rho being equal to zero would mean that the two random variables are uncorrelated, and rho being equal to one or minus one means they are positively or negatively correlated, okay? 
So that is the measure that we often see and that is kind of something that is very typical in statistics. And if we draw a straight line somewhere, uh, you could say, are we doing linear regression? And that's exactly right because this correlation coefficient is giving us basically the slope, I think, of the um, linear regression function between these two variables. So we can also have an empirical correlation coefficient, which basically means now, given some data set, yeah, in this case samples x1 to xn or y1 to X, yn, um, here's a formula how to empirically calculate it, okay? And that is just done by replacing the expectation with a summation, where here a 1 over n is maybe missing, however we have a 1 over m also at the bottom removed, so this is really an estimate of the covariance, but times n, and this is the standard deviation, but times n, and so um, it will cancel out the number of things. Good, um, so this is an empirical way to calculate it. Um, when we look at the formulas here more closely, actually what we are calculating here is kind of an inner product between two vectors, right? So suppose the mean is zero, okay? If the mean is zero, we really have the summation of xi times yi, which is the inner product of an n-dimensional vector x and an n-dimensional vector y. So we are looking whether in a hundred-dimensional space they are basically pointing to the same direction or to opposite directions, okay? So it can be also viewed geometrically, this empirical correlation coefficient. So with other words, the empirical correlation coefficient is some normalized inner product between two vectors. That's a way to see it. Another way to see it, if you know what this is, it's also a second order statistics. Yeah, so an example of a first order statistics would be, for example, the mean, where the data is only raised to the power of one. However, here I'm multiplying data with itself. So in principle, the degree of this one is to the power of two, right? And you also can see it at the units. That's why it's a second order statistic. Um, another point of view is, that the rho is looking at the scatter plots through Gaussian glasses, right? So what do I mean by that one? So basically, if I'm having, um, let me draw a picture. So suppose this is your data set, okay? So now I'm in 2D, so maybe X and Y. And I can estimate the mean, fine, so it will be something in the middle over here, so that would be my mu x mu y vector, fine. And then I could also calculate a covariance matrix, let's call it C, which is sigma x squared and sigma y squared, and I called it here C, but there must be a better letter. I forgot which one it is. Um, and this is describing kind of the ellipticity of my data. Okay, so can you swap the screen? Okay, let me swap the screen. Okay, that's better, right? So, but the sound is good? Okay, sounds good. Sorry. So here's my Gaussian data set. So this is sampled from a Gaussian distribution and I can, um, I can calculate the mean, which might be right here. I can calculate the covariance matrix, which is describing the ellipticity of this data. Um, so far, so good. That's a great description of my Gaussian distribution. Typically, my Gaussian distribution is is really described by some mean and by some true covariance matrix here. However, if my data set actually looks like this, suppose I'm having two clusters, right? I'm also having X and Y, and I can also calculate the mean, but now my mean is something in here where there's no data, and my ellipticity maybe is something very long, then you see that this are now two parameters of another Gaussian distribution, right? So that might be some mu2 and some sigma2, so this might be mu1 and sigma1. Um, however, it's only a very partial description of my actually distribution. So a much better distribution description would be to say I'm having here a cluster and here a cluster and I'm having a mixture of Gaussian or something. So now what I mean by putting up my Gaussian glasses is that if my data set is actually something more complicated, but then I, I take on my Gaussian glasses, then everything looks like a Gaussian. And by that I mean I calculate a mean and I calculate a covariance matrix. And so I'm only looking at these properties of my 
data distribution. So I'm looking at it like it would have been a Gaussian distribution. Similarly, when you calculate the correlation coefficient, you're also looking at your data through Gaussian glasses. So you're only interested in second order statistics. So you're only interested in properties that would describe a Gaussian distribution. Okay, but you are forgetting about lots of the details. So now the first important sentence here is correlation does not imply causation. So I think the examples from the beginning made that already clear where we always had a very strong correlation, but of course the causation is very questionable. Um, why? Nonetheless, we often think if we can draw a line, yeah, then this must be also something causal. It's typically if we have the background knowledge, how things work, or if we know something about the mechanisms that generated the data, that sometimes such a conclusion could make sense if we see some correlation that we see causation. Or if we have some experimental setup where we basically um, for example, randomly assigned um, placebos and medications and by having a randomized experiment and then seeing a very strong correlation between getting the medication and getting cured, in that case, the correlation does imply a certain causation. However, there's more to say when to say it and there's something about the experiment that we need to specify about how we generated the data. So. Sometimes correlation can give us very interesting hints, right? So sometimes we just need to investigate further and come up with an interesting experiment to find out. Actually, there was a very nice web page on Google, which was called Google Correlate. Yeah, this is one of these, I think they had these Friday projects. I don't know whether they still have it. When you were working at Google like 20 years ago or something, I think every Friday or maybe even every Thursday, I forgot, you could work on whatever you like. And I think this is the result of one of these things. So it's a correlation search engine. So you can, um, whatever, look at the, whatever, the, you take um, uh, you, you take one time series, for example, the number of stocks, and then the Google correlate would look through big databases of time series and would find time series that correlate very much with the number of stocks, even though they have nothing to do with each other. So with such a search engine, it's very easy to create like highly correlated data, but where there's actually no connection between them, right? And so how do you do it? You just need a big enough database and then you will find some data sets that just by chance are very correlated. And this is called spurious correlation, yeah? So that's something that you might want to Google for. If you Google the web for spurious correlation, Then you find lots of examples and lots of fun websites which show the correlation of the number of movies that a certain actor made and the number of power plants that are built in China or some other things. Okay, so there are these very strange connections which totally don't make sense at all. Um, unfortunately, it's not there anymore. So um, if you find a, another Google Correlate clone or something, please let me know. I will include it into this lecture. So because it's always fun to have a live demo on these things. Good. So to get a better feeling now for this empirical correlation coefficient, let's look at some data sets. Okay, so let's look with our eyes at some data sets and let's estimate the correlation coefficient. So here's the first one. So here's a row of plots of scatter plots, right? So one is variable X, the other one is variable Y. So could you tell me the correlation coefficients of these ones? So let's start with the top left one. So what's the correlation coefficient of that one? Can anyone guess? Yes, you're very quick. You can all put it into the chat. And the more things I see, the more I believe that, that you are listening, right? So the first answer is already perfectly right. So what about the last one? So the correlation is equal to one. What about the last one? What is that one? What correlation? Minus one, very good. What about the one in the middle? It's zero. Okay, this one might be 0 0.99. That's right. Yeah, of course, it's all numerics. Um, this one is zero. And what about the one, uh, let's say, this one on the left-hand side? So what it, what would might be there, the correlation coefficient? Any guesses for this one? So this one, yeah, 0 0.8, something like that. So here are the true numbers. So you yeah, are very good. So you are work, you are experts already on this topic perfectly. So let's look at other ones. So what about these ones? Um, okay, we know already this one is plus one. This one is minus one. 
So now what about this one over here? Does anyone know what the correlation coefficient of that one is? Could you submit it? Okay, the first choice is one. Another choice? 0 0.8, another guess? Yet another one? Maybe no, no more, okay, fine. So what about this one here? The one below the minus 0 0.4, what would be the, the correlation coefficient of, of this one over there? Any guesses? One again, okay. And another, another choice, plus one. Okay, let's look at it. Okay, very good. So actually these are all one. And the reason is that for calculating the correlation coefficient, we are always normalizing with the variance of these things. And so here, like the variance is larger, um, and that means that basically we are decreasing the number that we get. So there's a bigger spread in all directions. Nonetheless, we see that it's kind of like an ellipsoidal thing here. If we have something like um, a straight line, then we are perfectly aligned and we will have the perfect correlation coefficient. Yeah. So it doesn't matter that the slope is getting closer to zero because the scaling of the y-axis really plays no role, right? Because the scaling of the y-axis just changes the variance. Um, on the other hand, in the middle here, basically the variance of the y-axis is zero. And so we cannot divide by zero. And for that reason, now there is no correlation in, in this one. So we don't, we cannot even write zero in here at, for, the, uh, for the center one, okay? And then it's flipping to the minus one. Okay, here's a more challenging one. So what about these ones? They are more, more fun. So which one do you want to start with? Um, let's, let's take the, 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 the square one here. What about this one? This, this square, which is like, like on, on one of the, the edges. So what, so the thing is now we are getting out of our comfort zone here, right? Our comfort zone are Gaussian distributions. That's where we have a good intuition. These are much harder, right? So what would be maybe the correlation of these ones? So it looks a little bit elliptical kind of now, but actually it's a square. So any guesses? You can also, if you have a guess for that one, then please tell me one, two, three, four, five, six. And you just say the six colon, and then you tell me what it is. So there's a guess. It says one. So this is correlated with one. Someone else? Or you have another one? Are they correlated? Okay, I resolve it. These are all uncorrelated, okay? And this is not really surprising and weird, right? So why is this one, why on earth is it, un, are they uncorrelated? Um, the thing is, connection problems. Okay, I hope the, the recording is good. Um, my my um, wireless LAN connection is not very good. Maybe that might be part of the problems. Um, so why are they all uncorrelated? That's kind of surprising. Because if I know, for example, in this circle one, if I know that, let's say the x variable, this one on the x axis is zero, then I know the y must be something like plus one or minus one. So I know a lot about the other variable. And similarly, if I know that the y is equal to zero, I know a lot about the x, it will be plus one or minus one. However, this is statistical dependence. So the x and y are statistically dependent in this case, but they are perfectly uncorrelated, okay? And you can generate the data yourself and then calculate the correlation coefficient and you will be surprised that it's exactly zero. Similarly here, somehow even though it tells us a lot if I know the value of x or if I know the value of y, so they're really not statistically independent, but they are perfectly uncorrelated. Similarly for the square, actually any rotation of the square leads to uncorrelated data. Okay, and this is an even more difficult example. Here you really see that um, x is the cause of y, right? So this is like the sine function plus some noise. And basically, if you know the, the position of the x, you very much know the value of the y, right? However, nonetheless, they are uncorrelated, okay? The data sets are tuned to be uncorrelated like that. Uh, but the points are not like put at particular locations. So if you generate a square like that, it will be approximately zero, yeah? Okay, so our intuitions sometimes fail on these things. And in particular, we see, even if there's no correlation between two random variables, yeah, there, there could be some law behind it, which tells us how to compute one from the other, 
right? So, so now what did we learn? So first we learned correlation, positive or negative, does not imply causation. Now what we learned from this slide is if two variables are uncorrelated, it doesn't mean that one couldn't be the cause of the other, right? So even worse. So basically the correlation, positive and negative correlation, doesn't tell us that one is the cause of the other. And zero correlation does also not exclude that one is the cause of the others. So those are really different properties. So it does not imply independence. And they could be uncorrelated, but X could be the cause of Y. That is the example on the bottom left. Okay, so far so good. Um, again, the insights are correlation measures similarity between two curves, for example, if you look at two time series. Um, however, it's not statistical dependence. It's really very, very different. Um, it's not completely different, though. If you know your distribution, your true distribution is Gaussian distributed, then correlation and dependence are very closely related. However, if you look at non-Gaussian data, and most of the stuff in the world that is interesting is non-Gaussian, in that case, the correlation is not very useful. Okay, so far so good. I think we covered all of this. Um, so let's move on to the next topic. So now let's find a new notion, which we can kind of also pin down mathematically, ideally, yeah, that helps us now to talk about causality. And here's the key is mechanisms. So instead of talking about joint distributions, about P of X comma Y, about uh, a summary of, of my data set, basically, I need to talk about how the data was generated. And a generative model typically is also a causal model. Okay, maybe for that one, um, before I give you the toy example, um, let me tell you something on the board. So here's a causal, causal model, okay? So my causal model will be a little Python program, okay? And my Python program will first assign x the outcome of a coin flip, let's say a fair coin flip, and then y might be the outcome of a coin flip, maybe an unfair coin, plus the x. Okay, so this might be zero between zero and one. And maybe let's take as an operation here, x or, okay, so let me write it out, x or. Yeah, so this is just also something in zero and one. So by just looking at x and y, we cannot really distinguish them. So, and there will be a certain joint distribution, yeah, that can be written, for example, as P of X times P of Y given X, okay? And we could also spell out the exact distributions here. So the P of X is one half for X being equal to zero and also for X being equal to one. And the P of Y given X, it's a bit more complicated. However, as you know, using the um, product rule, we can also factorize it the other way around and these two representations, they are really symmetric. So if I only have data, X and Y, yeah, then looking at the joint distribution doesn't tell me whether my model is actually Z1 or Z1. So both are perfectly valid. And for both of them, I can calculate distributions in this case, okay? So such a probabilistic model is not describing everything that's going on here causally, because now, I, for example, I would like to know, so, there is some world where the data was generated. What if I manipulate the x? Does it change the distribution of y or not? What if I manipulate the y? Does it manipulate the distribution of x or not? However, if I have my computer code over here, then I can answer the question, right? So this is my computer code. It's telling me how the data was generated. So I could generate it by flipping a coin, and then I flip a coin, an unfair coin, and make an xr with x. So if I now change the world and always set the x, for example, to 1, this will, of course, change the distribution of the y, right? And this is called an intervention, right? So this is really changing my model in one location, changing one mechanism, how I generated the data, and it will influence the distribution of y. So in this case, I would say x is the cause and y is the effect. 
On the other hand, if my intervention would set y to 1, yeah, then this is only replacing this equation with y equals 1, but the x distribution is staying the same. So in this case, manipulating the effect doesn't affect the cause. So this description here now allows me to answer these kind of interventional questions. This description down here does not. Okay, so probabilities are not enough to talk about um, causal models. And so it's more about the mechanisms. So let's look at a toy example for mechanisms. So here's an, uh, a toy story. So studies show that married people are happier. Okay, so we have a couple of conclusions. It could mean marrying makes us happy. Yeah, one possibility. It could also mean no one marries unhappy people. Yet another story. Or it could mean that there's a common cause that makes us happy and likely to marry, right? Similarly, like the gene that makes us getting cancer and starting to smoke. Or the study is um, kind of wrong in the sense that it's just measuring like a, a random thing. So they have nothing to do with each other, but somehow the Google correlation search found out that people who are married are also happier, but the happiness and the marriedness has nothing to do with each other. So it's pure coincidence. And it's also only pops up because we looked at so many variables of people. So maybe we had like whether they're married, whether they are whatever, wearing glasses and whether they have bad teeth or whether they are happy or whether they are sad. And we just have enough variables so that we also found some that are very strongly kind of correlated. So that's the fourth possibility. Um, we can express these four possibilities now by writing little computer programs or little graphical models or little stories. So for that now we let's call the being married random variable m and the being happy random variable h. And then we could, for example, describe these four scenarios as words. We could say, if you get married, you are likely to be more happy. And this could be um, written as m causes h. Similarly, we could say, if you are more happy, you are more likely to marry. That would be h causes m, okay? or there's a common cause, then C causes H and M, or they are independent and then the random variables are independent. Okay, so that's four scenarios described with four different words. We could also use four graphs, and those are now like Bayesian networks. However, they are now causal Bayesian networks, so they have more implications. However, they distinguish these four situations equally well as the four stories that we just seen. So one could be the cause of the other or the other way around. And so here you see that we have now an asymmetry. So the representation is this graph and the graph either has an error in one or the other direction. Or there's a third node pointing both or there's no connection. Okay, so those are better descriptions of the data than just looking at the joint distribution. Here's yet another one as computer programs. So this is just telling us how the data was generated. And maybe one of them is generating the data as nature does it. Okay. I'm not saying that one is true, two or three or four. Those are just four different descriptions which lead to the same data. Okay. Um, we could also use probabilities or we could try. However, the joint distribution can be factorized starting with p of m, and it can be also factorized with p of h, right? So the factorization itself might describe now which model is the right one, but if we look at the joint distribution, it's always the same for all these four scenarios, okay? So the joint distribution is not enough. So this is just giving you, a, again, an overview, but I think it should be obvious that those are all descriptions of the same kind of set of things here, okay? So they all kind of describe a mechanism to generate the data. And then out comes a certain joint distribution. But the joint probability distribution does not describe the mechanism. So in the joint distribution, we forgot about the ordering in which the data was generated, okay? In particular, from the joint distribution, I cannot read off what will happen if I manipulate one of the variables, okay? So we need something like these graphs, computer programs, or factorization of the joint. Um, so the notation can be extended, uh, so the notation of probabilities can be extended, and this is just very sketchy what I show you here. So there's Perl's causal hierarchy, and hierarchy means there are three different levels. 
And there are three different levels of statements that we can talk about. So the basic level are the classical probabilities as we know them, the, the conditional probabilities, and they can answer observational questions. So with observational questions, I mean, you are collecting data and you put it into an Excel sheet, and then there are certain questions that you can answer with that data. And the questions are called observational because they are of the form, if I see A, yeah, what is Y? Or with other words, how does the probability distribution, um, what is the probability distribution of Y given that I know capital A has a particular value? Yeah, I can answer these questions. However, I cannot typically answer a question, what if I change the value of A yeah, what then the probability distribution of Y? And now Perl is extending this conditioning on A into a conditioning of do of A, where the do of A is not really a condition, but it's more something like I'm manipulating the generative model, how the data was generated. So on the board, if I want to talk about P of A, uh, P, of, um, P of X given do Y, then I'm talking about a situation where I manipulate this computer program where I'm replacing the generating equation for the y with one where I set it to a particular value. And then I talk about the resulting distribution of the x. In this case, it is surprisingly the same as p of x given y. Yeah, So it doesn't change at all. Um, no, it's not like this. I think, I think it's just p of x in this case. Okay, and in the other case, so it's, it's, equ it's not equal to P of X given Y. However, for the other one, P of X, uh, P of Y given do X, I'm manipulating the cause, and then it turns out that this is the same as P of Y given X. Okay, so that one is really just equal to P of X. It's not really changed anything if I set the value of Y, and the P of X in general is different from P of X given Y. However, if I manipulate the cause, then basically these two probabilities are the same. The conditional one is the same as the do one. So there's a whole theory behind this do operator here. And of course, there's a calculus for that one, the so-called do calculus and many other things. Um, you see now observations are nice. However, interventional statements are typically the things that I want to answer, right? I want to know if I increase taxes, what will happen, right? I want to, I want to, predict what will happen to the world after a certain intervention. And the key question in causality is, how can we calculate these quantities, for example, from observational quantities? Yeah? So there's some interesting results, some interesting identifiability results, and in particular also a couple of super interesting non-identifiability results at certain things we cannot predict from observational data. So now you might wonder, so what is the third one? So the third one is about counterfactual statements. That's even more advanced. So instead of asking what's happening if I do something, I could ask, let's suppose I did um, I did A, uh, I did A prime, yeah? Let's say I did really A prime. Now my counterfactual statement is what would happen if I did things differently? So this is purely hypothetical. It's like saying, uh, what is this thing? So let's say you're playing poker and you, you're having two cards and they are not very good, but maybe whatever, a three of clubs and a four of clubs. So you typically would fold immediately, right? And don't invest more money in, let's say, Texas Hold'em. Um, and then you watch the game and as the game unfolds and you see the flop and the river and so on, and they are all from clubs. So in principle, you could have had a flush, okay? Then basically you could have the statement, so what is my probability of winning if I wouldn't have folded, okay? If I didn't went out of the game. So that's a really interesting statement. So basically that allows you to learn from situations. So you have certain observations and you see how things are going. And from that in your mind, you want to conclude what would have happened if things would have been differently? And that's beyond the observation and beyond the interventional statements. So, and Pearl in his book, he extends basically the notion of probabilities to these kind of situations, which is, I think, super interesting. Um, and it's super relevant for artificial intelligence because um, a robot is not just observing things and 
then telling us something about correlations in the world or something or independencies or something. But the robot should also take its own actions. And for that, um, the robot must find out about interventional statements. Ideally, the robot experiences things and should do better next time. And for that, he might even need counterfactual statements and be able to reason about that one. Okay, so here's an overview plot that I copied from the Peters book. So there are these probabilistic models yeah, and some observations that we've seen and they kind of um, are parallel to each other. So there's the probabilistic model um, that can tell us something about the observations. And if we have observations, we can estimate parameters of the probabilistic model. So this is statistical world, okay? So going from the data to our model is like parameter estimation and going from the model to my data, this is like estimating the mean or something like that. This is typically called probabilistic reasoning. However, there's a whole new world out there called where the same things are also for causal models. So we can, instead of having probabilistic models, we could have causal models, which tell us something, how the data was generated. And that tells us much more, not only about observations and outcomes, but also if I do interventions and other things. So this is super powerful. However, often we only have observational data. So all we have is a probabilistic model. And in these cases, it's hard to get to the causal model and to get like the benefits of the causal model. But nonetheless, the question of course is, so what kind of observations, what kind of experiments do I have to do to get a causal model? However, sometimes we can infer from observations directly up to the causal model with some additional assumptions. And that will be the next topic. So it's going from data, from observations, right to the model. And this topic is called causal discovery. And there's quite a bit of history on that one. In particular, let me flip back to one of the books. I think this causation prediction and search, that's covering a lot of these things where you have observational data and you want to recover a model. And they're covering typically the case of having several random variables. However, they are not covering the case of having only two random variables, which is a very interesting one, but a very challenging one. So let's look at that one. So this is called causal discovery. And the starting point is you're given a data set like that. So this is your data. You have two random variables. And the goal now is to find out what is the cause and what is the effect. And without assumption, this is completely impossible, as I said, right? So if you just have a joint distribution, you cannot really decide it. And now the curious research here is, so what additional assumption do we have to pose, maybe to the distribution, to the data generation, or to whatever, such that we can infer which is which, okay? And for example, if you look at this data, can you infer which is which? Um, I'm not sure, I think I can't. But um, when I show you the axis, then kind of from the story, we can infer it. So those, each point here is a German city. Yeah, and each German city has a particular altitude. So most of them are in flat areas. And then there's the Zugspitze up here, which has a very high altitude. And then there's the temperature. So this is the average year temperature, okay? And you see that there's also some nice correlation between the two. And we also know one is the cause and one is the effect. So um, let me uh, ask you, so who thinks the temperature is the cause and the altitude is the effect? Or you could also say, so the question, or let me rephrase it, then you can use the chat. So what is the cause? Please type either temperature or altitude. So what do you think? And now you can use your world knowledge. You don't have to look at the scatter plot, right? You can use your world knowledge. What is the cause? What is the what is the cause? Is the question. The cause is of course the altitude. Yes, that's kind of um, in the in the classroom now. I would ask you, but I'm now just telling you because you might not want to have your voice on YouTube. So of course the reason is we can have a simple simple experiment. So let's say um, you are in Borkum, yeah, it's the North Sea, right? And you measure the temperature, great, right? might be very, um, uh, in this case, very flat and it might be very warm. Now what's happening if you build a big tower there, like a light lighthouse, a super high lighthouse, and then you measure the temperature at the top of the lighthouse, right? You will see that the temperature will decrease, right? It will be colder up there. And 
that's one experiment. The other experiment is, suppose you are um, on the same island at the beach, right, at zero, and you have a certain temperature, and now you are increasing the temperature with one of these heating heating devices, right, with some burning some fossil fuels, and you're heating up the air where you're standing. It won't change your altitude, right? Your altitude stays the same. So in this case, the altitude is really the cause and the temperature is the effect. So this is a nice data set from the tubing pairs data set. So there you can download like a hundred different data sets where typically X is the cause and Y is the effect. And this is a benchmark data set um, where people try to apply different methods to infer automatically the cause and the effect. And this is a very difficult problem. And if you ask people from the statistics department, they will say it's impossible. However, with certain machine learning methods, they are better than chance. So there are methods that reach like 80% performance on these ones. So uh, it's, it's possible to do this with the right assumption. And if the, the data set kind of fulfills these assumptions, I mean, this is real world data, so you never know, but it turns out that some of these data sets, they appear to fulfill these assumptions. You can estimate it. Here's another example. Again, this is kind of not so easy to figure out if you don't know the axis, but the axis is age and wage per hour. So how much money do you make per hour? And they are kind of, yeah, I'm not sure whether they are correlated, but also here there are methods that can determine that age in the scatter plot is the cause and wage per hour is the effect. Okay. And in the book from Jonas Peters and colleagues, there are a couple of methods explained how to do this, how this works. Okay. And I think it's, it's quite exciting that this is possible. Here's another one. It's horsepower and miles per gallon. So miles per gallon is basically how far can you drive? So it's like the inverse, I think of, the um, how much liter per kilometer, per hundred kilometers, so that's miles. How much miles do you have to, can you drive with a single gallon? Yeah, so large is good, small is bad. And you see that it's kind of negatively correlated with the horsepower, and it's curious to see whether you can infer it from the data. Here's another one, which is horsepower and acceleration, and so on and so forth. What is this one? Oh yeah, this is the day of the year from one to 365, and the temperature, okay? And also here, it's kind of clear um, that the day or the temperature, so by changing the temperature, you cannot change the day, but by changing the day, you can change the temperature, right? So basically moving the Earth at another location around the sun, you would change the temperature on the Earth. So again, it's clear that X implies Y. So that's quite interesting data set. And there's also a paper, which I reference here, where they compare different methods on this data set. And it's kind of, uh, it's 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 very surprising when you see it first. That it's possible at all. So it's really opening a new field of research, I think. Um, so they are not working perfectly. So if you have real world data, often they fail. Yeah. So there's still a lot of research to do. So the sometimes the assumptions are just not true. So there's different wordings here. Some. Most of people, what I just showed you is called causal discovery. So you want to infer the causal graph from data. This is sometimes also called causal learning. So given the data and for the model, the other way around typically is called causal inference or causal reasoning. Yeah. So given the causal model that you got from some domain expert, infer something about the future, infer something about data that you observe. Okay, again, the plot, I think I went over that one. Um, so far, so good. Or any questions? You ask in the chat, right? So no questions so far. The people with camera are still nodding. So that's a good sign. Okay, let me show you another fun, fun thing. So everything that has the word paradox in the headline, I think is attractive, right? So that's something where you think, so this is, you should have a look at it because it's kind of challenging your, your knowledge. So if you have a Wikipedia page where there's something with paradox, that's always worth reading. And so there's Simpson's paradox, which is a really interesting effect in statistics. And the more you think about it, the more you think about causality. Once you understand causality, there's no paradox anymore. It's just this, this effect that is there and it's obvious that it must be like that and it can't be other. But when you see it first, it really looks kind of paradoxical. So what is this paradox? So here's the classical example. I think I took it from the Wikipedia page on Simpson's paradox. 
So the University of California at Berkeley yeah, was sued, so was uh, pulled to court in 1973 because the admittance rates for women was much lower than for men. Okay, so here are the numbers. So 44% um, men were admitted from 8,000 applicants and there were fewer applicants for women, but there were only 35% admitted. So this is horrible, right? So this is very bad. Is this a gender bias? So let's figure out who to blame. So let's have the same statistics now for each department separately, okay? We want to figure out the people who did this admission procedure so wrongly and who were really kind of violating the rights of women in this case. Surprisingly, when you looked by splitting up all the number of applicants to the different departments, yeah, curiously, in each of the departments, oh, but one very small one, um, the, the women had a higher admittance rate than the men, okay, in most of them, okay. So it's kind of unclear now. So if I look at all the data, it looks like the women were not admitted fairly, but uh, when you look at each department level, like you suddenly see that the women kind of um, had an advantage and the, the, that was against the men, basically, right? So, and now the question is, so now what is right? Is it, is it right to look on the department level or is it better to look at the global scope, okay? And that is Simpson's paradox. So you really can check the numbers. Everything is fine, yeah? There are also, there's a paper on Simpson's paradox, which I have, I think, on my screen. Oh, yeah, I have it on my screen. So here's also another, no, that's the wrong one. Where is it? It is, was on, on Corona, and there's also some Simpsons paradox effect. Ah, yeah, there it is. So here we go. So there's a, a whole new paper from 2021, which is also identifying Simpsons paradox in COVID-19 case fatality rates. And they compare the numbers of Italy and China, and then they kind of see if you look at the overall cases, you get one outcome, and if you look at the cases where you look at each age group, you get the opposite one, okay? So that's another instance of the Simpsons paradox, and it's super interesting. So, now, which is correct? Um, so, I only tell you with words. The thing is, or I, I draw a graphical model, and then maybe it's getting already clear. So, let's draw a graphical model for that one. So, So there's the admittance variable and then there's the gender, okay? And of course it would be very, very bad if the gender would influence whether you get admitted to a university or not, okay? However, there's another variable, the department. And of course, some departments are super popular, yeah? Like computer science and others might be not so popular and I don't give an example here, but um, of course, the admittance rate depends on the department, okay? However, as it turns out, also the gender will influence your choice of department, right? And that's something where the university uh, can proactively maybe do something, but in general, there are certain departments which are less attractive to men and some that are less attractive to women. And the reasons for that one are deeper in childhood and in our society and how we grow up. However, the thing is, if now all women apply to departments, yeah, which have a very, very large uh, rejection rate and only very few men apply to those ones, it can happen that in each department, even though that women are having an advantage, Overall, women are at a disadvantage because women apply to departments which are much more challenging to get admitted to. Okay, and then if that's the case, and that was the case in this data, that women were applying to departments where many more people got rejected than at other departments, then overall it could look like there's a gender bias even though there isn't, even though there is it the other way around. Okay, so the reason here is now um, if you look at this graphical model, then one can fully understand how, why the data is like it is. As another example, um, there's a so-called kidney stone example. I think it's also from Wikipedia. So this is now the, the new young researcher found a new treatment against kidney stones. Okay, let's say treatment B. And um, 
No, he found a new treatment called treatment A, and treatment B is the old one. And um, as a researcher, you were very disappointed that unfortunately the recovery rate of your new treatment yeah, is slightly worse than the old one. So that's very bad. And so you can't publish it, right? Because I wanted to publish a new treatment. However, um, my, um, my recovery rate is much lower than the existing one. Um, however, if I look at the size of the stones, suddenly everything turns around. So if I have two groups of patients, some patients with small stones and some patients with large stones, yeah, then it turned out that my treatment is better than the old treatment. Okay, and so this is another instance of Simpson's paradox. Yeah, so now, okay, great, so I can write a paper on small stones. And I have another paper on large stones. And in both of these papers, my method is better than the old one. However, I shouldn't write a paper where I kind of summarize all the data, right? So this is another instance of Simpson's paradox. And um, also in this case, what is correct, right? So it's kind of unclear. Um, again, we can draw a graph for that one. And I tell you the story or the solution. So the graph, of course, is very similar to the one that we have. We just need to be careful with the errors. So we have the treatment and then we have the outcome or whether we got cured or not. And then we have the size of the stones. And of course, the size of the stone will influence whether you get cured or not. Yeah. Now the question is, what about this error? And as it turns out in this medical example, the error goes the other way around. And the size of the stones might say, okay, those are, uh, let's see what the data was sell telling us. So it turned out that for the small stones, the, the old treatment was used. And only for these larger stones, for the more heavy cases, I used treatment A. So somehow the number, the, the people here that kind of got treated with method number A were most likely people who are having large stones, who are having bigger problems. So overall, the outcome is worse than the other one. Okay. So again, here, the, the thing can be resolved by drawing a little diagram and then everything should be fine. Um, by the way, another, I, I give you a final example of the um, Simpsons paradox. There, there could be also, here's a nice toy problem, which is basically, I hope I can recover it. So, Let's say your data looks like this, right? Then if you look at group one, so this is group one, and this is group two. In group one, you have a negative correlation between X and Y, right? So you can draw a line like that. So the correlation coefficient will be negative. In group two, you also have a negative correlation coefficient, okay? However, when you look overall, you have a positive correlation coefficient, okay? So this is like a very technical um, example of Simpson's paradox where that is very abstract, but I think it's catching some of the essence of it. So in one group, you could have negative correlation and in the other group as well, but overall you have a positive correlation. And when you look at it like this, it's kind of obvious that that's fine, okay? Anyway, I think this is it for today. Time's up. Um, I thank you for your extended attention. I in particularly thank two students for switching on the camera. That's very nice. Otherwise, teaching is really impossible if you just look at um, names. So thanks a lot for that one. And all I can say now is I wish you happy holidays and Merry Christmas and a nice new year. And we see each other again in January. Okay, so thanks for being here and bye bye.